Well, good morning, church. It is so good to be with you this morning, and we have the privilege of continuing on in this series, Five Easy Steps to Wreck Your Lives. And this morning, we're going to deal with a tough topic on how to become an addict. Now, you would think I would tell you how not to become an addict, but the adversary likes to find his way into your lives. And when you think about this whole idea of what addiction and addicts look like, have you ever wondered, I mean, really, have you ever wondered how these people get to such a dark and empty place where it's so evident to us the danger in it? I mean, have you ever considered that? Those people and their weakness, those people and their lack of discipline, their selfishness, and their utter spirit of destruction. I mean, when I look at these people, how can they make such decisions knowing how it's going to impact their families, how it's going to bring a negative aspect to their own lives? What are we to do with those people? Church, those people make up the sum of each of us. But Pastor, I thought you were talking about addicts, and I'm surely not one of them. Well, you know what? Denial is what I would expect from an addict. So if you're in a position of denial, listen up. Before you get too upset with me about calling you an addict, all right, I get it. I want you to relax, and I want you to be open, to let your, yourself hear the word, to allow God's word to bring that discovery of that dark place that we often choose to live in. Well, let's begin this morning by defining what an addict is anyway. An addict is one that devotes or surrenders themselves to something habitually or obsessively. It's a person who cannot stop something or using something else. That definition kind of is a broad spectrum. Well, let's look a little further into what addictions are. I mean, if we're going to talk about addicts, let's talk about addictions. It defines addictions as this, as a condition that results when a person ingests a substance, like alcohol, cocaine, heroin, or one who engages in activities such as gambling, sex, or shopping. Hmm. All these things that can be pleasurable, it says, but the continuation, which becomes, it says, compulsive and interferes with ordinary disciplines in our everyday life, in our workplace, in our home, and with our friendships. That's what addictions do. They tear us down. But you know, it's interesting when we look at when we were born, all of us had this element in us. When we are born, we have this within us to connect, to want to bond. We see this. That failure to thrive is when you take a baby out of a nurturing environment. We have this desire to connect and bond. Well, what does that look like? I mean, we bring that little infant home, and they begin to realize that they're outside of the womb, and they want to be warm, they want to be fed, they want all these things. What do we do with that? There was this wonderful invention called the pacifier. Uh-huh. We all love that as parents, stick it in their mouth and try to get them to believe that they have something that they really don't, but it pacifies them. Now, we would believe that we would grow out of that stage, right? That we no longer need pacifiers. We put them on the shelf and we get on with life. But if we're honest with ourselves, we continue, even as adults, to continue to pacify our lives, believing that we need this and we need that, and we bring it into our lives as if that's going to be the thing to bring us a complete spectrum of what life is all about. We pacify ourselves. But yet, God has such a different idea for us. But this whole idea of addictions, it runs deep within our lives. Now, when you think of addictions, probably the three top elements that come to uh, the surface is uh, addictions to drugs, addictions to pornography, and gambling. Those are the three that you typically come to the forefront. But you know what? There's so much more that comes under this umbrella of addictions. But you're saying, oh, don't dare, Pastor, please don't talk about me being a foodie. Where I have to have food. That's not really an addiction, is it? If you have to have it, it is. If you're using it for entertainment, 
If you're using it to fill a void in your life, then being a foodie is an addiction. But then you look at it and say, well, don't talk about me being a compulsive shopper. I just have a lot of idle time, and you know, I just want to go walk the mall, right? Get some exercise. No, you're trying to fill a void. You, you say, oh, it brings me comfort. That's, what I, that's why I do it. You don't understand the stress I'm under. I just need to buy a few things. It makes me feel better about my life. That's an addiction. Don't talk about how I can't live without social media or my smartphone. That's not me. I, I can put it away. I really can. Really? How many of you have it turned off right now? <laughs> I'm not looking for hands. All right? <laughs> But this thing with addictions, it goes even further. It says, you know, I got people, I, my wife being one, don't mess with my coffee, okay? Don't talk to me until I have my first cup of coffee or my energy drinks, anyone? We don't look at that as potential addictions. You know, we don't want to talk about being attached and have to watch our soap operas and our reality shows and all these things. And you say, oh, good. At least the pastor hasn't mentioned mine yet, all right? Well, I still have a lot of sermon left, so I'll probably get there, all right? <laughs> but the point is that there's all these things that can draw us in and draw us away from God, and they are addictions. Because regardless of what it is, it can be overwhelming. It can be all-consuming. And it can put us in a position that we cannot see beyond it. We have to have it. And that is an addiction, something that keeps us from being the very person that God created us to be. You know, the mind is a very powerful thing. It really is. And I'm not here this morning talking about being an addict or addictions. I'm not here to try to debate whether it's chemically based or psychologically based and, and how much one is to the other. That's not my point this morning. My point is that Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And, you know, I came across an interesting uh, thing that was done with rats, of all things. They did a test. And what they did with it is they took some rats and they isolated them in, in just a, a compartment. And they didn't give them anything to excite them, anything to do. They just gave them two spigots of water. One was just water and the other one was laced with a narcotic. Now what they discovered in every account was once that rat was able to be introduced to that water with a narcotic, they continued to go back and back and back and back and back and back again. They had nothing else in there to do. And every one of them OD'd. Every one of them. Now, here's the interesting thing. They continued the test, and they said, okay, we're going to create another test for these rats. We're going to create what they called Rat Park. A little bit larger. It had other rats in it. They had hills to climb, things to do, shiny little things they could play with. But they still had the two spigots. Still had the water. Still had the other water laced with a narcotic. What they discovered is during that course of movement of life, they would come across the one that was laced with narcotic. They would sample it, occasionally come back to it. But they were more invested in all the other things that were going on around them. And not one ever OD'd. Now, I'm not here to tell you what that means. But I am to try to get you to think that we always believe that there is not an out, that it's you know, this is my reason why I can't escape it. But yet, we look at this sample and say, look, giving a positive environment can change the course of one's life. And that is true for each and every one of us. But Satan wants you to believe that there is no choice, that there is no out, that there is no change. Now listen to me. Satan doesn't, does not want you to be reminded of this truth. That through the name of Jesus, we see that demons were cast out. We see in the name of Jesus that people's lives were healed, that the dead were raised, and many lives were completely changed. Satan doesn't want us to know that. He doesn't want us to believe in that. So why have we allowed? Why have we allowed the name of Jesus to only be a point of conversation rather than a point of consideration for the victory in our lives. If we know this to be true, and he is the answer, then why are we not investing more deeply in that truth? Number one, I have to ask this question this morning. What has mastered you? 
when we talk about this whole thing of addictions and being an addict, what has mastered you? Well, first, define what master looks like. It means anything that is controlling you, anything that is consuming you, that is your master. We believe the lie sometimes, most times we do. And the lie is this, I can stop anytime I want. It's not really that bad. I don't have to have it. And we keep telling ourselves that. But the question I say is this, what do you think about constantly? In the course of any given day, what do you think about? What consumes your mind and your heart? What directs the course of your day? What do you anticipate at the end of the day when you get home, behind closed doors, all these things? What is consuming your mind? Because whatever is consuming your mind is what masters you. So think about it. If you can't wait to get off work and get that six-pack, if you can't wait to get home and turn on the Internet, watch a soap, do whatever it is. I don't care what it is. If that controls us, it masters us. And if that is the master of our lives, then we have no place for Christ to, to rule and reign. So let's think about this a little bit further. In James 4, James 4, 4, if you turn with me, James was talking to the church, and he was saying, there's many things that people are looking at to find pleasure in. In fact, they're looking everywhere but God to find this pleasure and fulfillment in life. And in verse 4, he goes in, and he says this to them. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. What an incredible truth. Because so many times we don't realize the impact of being so consumed by something. But I thought it was interesting that James began with those words, you adulterers. Interesting choice of words, wouldn't you say? I mean, two weeks ago we talked about adultery and marriage and, and how that's tied in there. That adultery is, is one taking these intimate feelings and intimate actions outside of the marriage. That that's adultery. So why would he say that to us? The church, say you adulterers, when it has to do with our relationship with God. Now, I get it when we talk about the vows in marriage and, and what that means. You make that agreement. But we also vow to God. When we surrender our lives, we are vowing to him that we will live a life of faithfulness and obedience. And what God is saying in these moments and why James was calling them adulterers is because he's saying you're taking the things that, that you're passionate about those intimate moments of your life, and you are living them outside the parameters of the relationship that God had called you into. You are adulterers. You're taking your love, your passion, your interest, and putting it into everything but God. We have to see it as that, because it is true. And so many times when we start living down that road, we start living this Jesus plus mentality, which I promise you will equal a lukewarm faith but let me expand a little bit further on this jesus plus this jesus plus can mean many things for us this jesus plus in our lives can be jesus plus pornography jesus plus food jesus plus sports and you're saying to go okay pastor you're getting a little out of control how could that even be said in the same sentence we live it every day we take jesus at face value and then we say jesus plus we sing songs and saying Jesus is enough. And we read in the word that Christ is sufficient. But when we have to add all these things to our lives to try to find fulfillment and still be empty, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you see where I'm going with this? That this Jesus plus mentality is never going to be a point of fulfillment. You know, Jesus understands the battles that we have. Jesus understands the battle for the devotion of our hearts. In fact, if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians, we're reminded of this incredible provision that God has given to us. In, in 1 Corinthians 10, pick it up in verse 13. In verse 13, he begins by saying these words. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptations to be more then you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So my dear friends, flee, flee from the worship of idols. Now this provision, God knows what we're going to be tempted with. 
But be reminded God does not tempt. He allows it. But he says in allowing that, we have to make a choice. But he says, I will always provide a way out. No matter how heavy or how hard the adversary is pushing in. He says, I promise you, I will give you a way out. So we have to begin to believe that truth. Because Satan wants to isolate us. And he wants to provide very quickly for us. A quick fix to life's frustrations, life's discouragement. He loves to play on our weaknesses. But God provides strength in our weaknesses. But listen to me. Why have we learned to love our weaknesses? Why have we learned to love our weaknesses and play the victim card with our family, our friends, and even with God? That victim card is, is that card where we say, you know what, I can't help myself. I have to have it. It calls to me. You don't realize what I'm going through, Pastor. It speaks to me all the time, and I, I can't resist it, whether it be food or pornography or any of the, those things that we often find in our lives. It doesn't matter what it is. But you know, Satan, he doesn't care what addiction you have. He just wants to make sure that you don't understand the answer and the hope that we can have in addictions. He would rather you stay in anything that's going to kill, steal, and destroy. And he doesn't want you to know the power of Jesus' name. He doesn't. And so many times we live there. So this morning we're going to begin to talk about five easy steps to become an addict that Satan would love for you to stand in. Absolutely love for you to stand in them. And the first one is this. Number one, don't admit you have a problem. Don't admit it. If you don't have a problem, then I don't have to deal with it. And if you think I have a problem, it's your problem because I don't have a problem because I didn't admit it. So if I don't admit it, it's not there. And we argue with ourselves about this. And here's the thing. We have terrible self-awareness. We've allowed the adversary to confuse and, and cloud our minds and our hearts that we believe what is right is wrong and what is wrong is right. The Bible teaches us that. We have to know the truth to be able to set it clear in our minds. Now, in Jeremiah, I love this. In Jeremiah 3, God is speaking through Jeremiah to the people of Israel. They are doing all kinds of things that they are opposed to God. They're living outside that parameter. In fact, he goes on, he says, you're prostituting yourself. And you have so many other lovers and he's not talking about individuals. He's talking about things, idols that we invest in. And he says, you adulterers, you are going outside of your parameters with God. And you are loving all these things but God. But here's the beautiful truth. Jeremiah is telling the people that God just wants you to come home. He wants to show you his mercy and restore you. And in verse 13, he says, only acknowledge your guilt. Admit that you rebelled against the Lord your God and committed adultery against him by worshiping idols under every green tree. Confess that you refuse to listen to my voice. I, the Lord, have spoken. God wants to restore. He wants to bring us home and give us the hope that we often have lost. But with this, it begins with ownership. With addictions, the first thing to overcoming them is ownership. We have to own them because if we don't even see that there's a problem, we won't even deal with it. We'll justify it. But we have to own it so that we can give it to God freely so he can do his work. The second step that Satan would love for us to live in is this. Gratify your fleshly desires. If he can continue to get us to live there, to get whatever high we get, whatever endorphins are released and whatever it is that we're doing, if he can live, get us to live there, to continue to gratify the desires of the flesh, it's going to be hard to pull that away. It's just like a drug. It's something we have to have. And Satan knows that. But in 1 John, we were here last week talking about when we focus on the world, this is an easy way to lose our faith. I'm just going to read verse 16 again to you. It says, For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but from this world. We have to realize that the world is pushing in on us. 
And when we look at our lives, I have to ask the question, church, what are we doing to protect the areas of our life that are ours to protect? Our mind, our home, our children, our relationships. Those we have freedom to protect. What are we doing? Are we doing anything within the home to make sure that pornography is not coming through our home? That we're not watching television that is just going to drag us down? What are we doing with our children to make sure they're not being exposed to all the filth of this world? They're going to see enough of it. What are we doing to protect them and provide for them? Because if we are living to gratify our flesh, it's going to be hard for us to see any of that. We have to make sure that we're taking those steps. I want to tell you what God has done for us. And his vow to us when he says, I am faithful. Through Jesus, we see this incredible picture. That he's with the disciples and they're sitting there going, Jesus, we don't want you to go. We need you. Don't leave us. And Jesus says, here's my vow to you. It's better that I go because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit will not be able to come and live within you. It is better that I go because he's going to give us the power within to be able to overcome any addiction, any draw of this world that we have. He's going to give us the power. We sing the song, same power that raised Jesus from the grave, lives within us. Do we believe it or not? I believe it. I believe it. And in Galatians, in Galatians 5, verse 16, it says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your own good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. Meaning that there is a heightened awareness in our lives now. It's not about just keeping the law And doing a checklist, it's about having the Spirit within us sanctify us from the inside out. And what that means is change us to be more like Christ. When we allow the Spirit to direct us, we die to this wicked flesh. And we clothe ourselves with Christ. And if our actions and our mindset is not a reflection of Christ, then we are allowing this world to consume us. And we've got to change that this morning. But then we go on to look at this. I admit my weaknesses almost daily to God. And I also admit that when I choose to live in my addictions, that it's not because I don't have a choice. I admit that I love my sin more than my Savior because that's the bottom line. It's a hard truth, isn't it? It's a hard truth to to hear, but it's one that we have to live in. Because when I choose to live in my sin, I'm choosing to turn my back on my Savior. Now, many of you may not want to hear this because, point three, rationalize your behavior and make excuses. We're great at this, especially when it comes to these things that we don't want to own as addictions in our lives. You know, when you look at behavior, it's an interesting thing, and the excuses go down the same road. But Jesus had a moment where he was able to speak into the lives of of many people. And he was able to show them how easy it is to live in excuses and to rationalize their behavior. Jesus was invited to have this incredible banquet with a leader of the Pharisee. Now, you have to realize these religious leaders were always trying to trap Jesus. They were always trying, they weren't trying to, to invite him in because they wanted to be friends with him. They wanted to kill him. But in this particular moment, as he's coming into this dinner, You know, he's looking around, and he sees this guy that is lame. His arms are swollen. His legs are swollen. And he's sitting there going, man, this guy needs to be healed. But he poses the question to them at this dinner table, and he says, is it okay to heal on the Sabbath? And not one of them responded. So Jesus went ahead and healed the man, and they said nothing. And he says, wouldn't it be so that if your son or your cattle fell into a hole on the Sabbath, you would go and tend to them? Again, they said nothing. But Jesus continued to watch what was happening. As people came into this banquet, they were pushing their way through, trying to get to the best seats. They wanted to sit up at the front. They wanted to be the honored ones. 
And Jesus said, wait a minute. This is not the way that you should approach this. You shouldn't take the seat of honor. You should take the least of these. And he began to tell them that when you have these banquets, don't just invite your friends and, and people of honor. He says, because your reward is in that. They can return the favor. He says, instead, go out and find the poor, the crippled, the lame, those that cannot repay you, and invite them in. And as they were listening to Jesus in this moment, one of the guys at the table was intrigued, and he says, man, Jesus, I can't imagine what it would be like to be at a, at a table, a banquet in, in the kingdom of God. Man, that would be amazing in heaven. And Jesus took that moment. He says, let me expand on this idea. Let me tell you a parable. He began to tell of a man that prepared this incredible banquet. And he says he sent out all kinds of invitations to everybody that was out there. And he says, when the banquet is ready, I will send out my servants to, to gather you up. That's where he was going. But I want to pick it up in verse, in chapter 14 in Luke. And I'll read specifically verse 18 through 20. In verse 18, he says, but they began making excuses. One says, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I now have a wife, so I can't come. All these excuses. They wanted to be at the banquet. But yet when it came time for it, they had all these excuses. And what Jesus was trying to teach them is that this invitation is real. I have given an invitation for salvation. And this invitation has been given to all. And so many people are making the excuses, not now, Jesus, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. And you know what? Tomorrow may not come. And if we are not at that banquet table with Jesus, there is no hope for us. But we cannot afford to live in the excuses of our lives, living outside of this. But if he can't get us there to make excuses, then the next step is this. Number four, keep your addiction a secret. This is where Satan loves to live. Don't let anybody know. They won't understand. They won't help you. They'll just condemn you. But yet, we see in Proverbs 28, 13. It says, people who conceal their sins will not prosper. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. Not from me, mercy from God. And that is so critical in our movement of this. So whatever you have in your life that is a secret, get it out. Confess it so that you can live in the mercy of God. But then number five, the fifth step here is depend on your own power, never God's. That's where Satan would love you to live. I've got this, God. Not that big of a problem. I just do it every once in a while. It's really not going to destroy my life. Good luck with that. Because I've seen that time and time again. It is destructive in every way. But here's the truth that Satan does not want us to hear. In 2 Corinthians 10, we pick it up in verse 3. It says, we are human, but we do not wage a war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture the rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Obey Christ. That's what it's about, is being able to come and understand this truth, that he has given us weapons that are not our own, but that are greater than anything that this world could ever throw at us. And in fact, we build upon this idea in Galatians 5.1. In Galatians 5.1, it says this. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. And do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. When you hear these words, it is a reality that our addictions enslave us. They consume us and they tear us down. And Christ came to give us freedom. That's why he is here. 
You know, Satan has stolen enough from us, church. Lied to us that there is no hope, no victory, no chance of changing. That's what he wants us to believe. And freedom cannot be found. Victory, victory will never be experienced if we don't deal with this question honestly. Second point. Who is the master in you? Who is the master in you? That's an important question. When we turn to Matthew 6, chapter, we pick it up in verse 24. It says, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. But it goes even beyond this. That may be one addiction. That may be one draw in life, but it goes across the board. You cannot serve God and pornography. You cannot serve God in, in a foul mouth. You cannot serve God. You put it in there. Whatever your addiction is or draw, you cannot serve both. It's impossible to have two thoughts at the same time. We've tried this before, and you guys couldn't do it. Nor can we live for good and evil at the same time. It's impossible. So we have to choose Who's going to master our lives? Who is the master of our lives? In 1 Kings, this was an interesting time. When Elijah was dealing with, with people that were following God, but many that were following Baal, worshiping this false god. And there was this big point of contention that was coming. And in this moment, Elijah called them all together. He says, you, you bring your prophets of Baal. Bring whatever you need to bring, but gather all the people up. And in that moment, this is what he said in chapter 18, verse 21. In verse 21, he says, Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. And I encourage you to read on in this chapter and see how God made his mark in this, that he made himself known that there is none greater than God himself. But Elijah had to put it out there, as we have to put it out there today. If you're going to follow God, then follow God. But if you're going to follow this world, then follow the world. Because remember, we learned this last week, this complements the scripture, where Jesus says, I'd rather you be hot or cold. I don't want you to be lukewarm. In fact, when you're lukewarm, it makes me want to vomit. These are serious truths because God has a hope for us. He doesn't want us to live in the misery of this world by any stretch. And when we entertain, when we entertain our addictions, we're always going to be in a spiritual conflict. There's no way around it because our lives are being controlled by other things outside of his spirit. In 1 Corinthians I kind of want to end in this idea. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it says, Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. This is a truth that we have to wrap our minds around. Because in the Old Testament, there was a time where the temple was there, and people would come to it, and they would gather the best of the best of the best to put the temple together. But now, he says, in the New Covenant, no longer is the temple built by human hands. You, us, we are the temple of God. His Spirit dwells within us. So why would we build this temple with anything less than what is good and profitable for the kingdom of God. But yet we do. I mean, I look at this. And he says, you are to be holy. Holy, again, is a simple truth of being set apart for a specific purpose. So if we are to be holy, we are set apart to be the temple, the indwelling of God's spirit. I mean, think about it. It really is this simple. If you have a car, you know that the motor is what moves the car. We put oil in the motor because that's what it needs to be able to Reduce the friction and, and do what it was created to do. It would be foolish to think that you could drain the engine out and pour water in and that it would go the same way. It would instantly seize. It would not serve us by any stretch. So why do we believe that we can pour the spirit out 
and pour the world in and believe that we can walk in light of the Spirit. It's not going to happen. For us to do and become what God created us to be, we have to have His Spirit flowing through us. We have to be surrendered to that Spirit and allow Him to direct us in that. So church, there are five easy steps and probably more to becoming an addict. Five, five easy steps to live in our addictions that God has called us to be free today. Not tomorrow, today. And church, I want to do something very different today. These have been some hard sermons, but it's because I love you. Because I want more for you. And as we enter into this time of prayer, coming out of that, I'm going to take you through just a few steps of confession. And as we enter into a time of offering and communion, there's going to be some people up here that would be more than glad to receive you and pray over you, to pray over you the freedom from addiction, whatever it is. You don't have to air your dirty laundry. That's between you and God. But we would be glad to pray with you in the power and the presence of the King, in Jesus' name. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to walk us through this. And I hope and I pray that each one of us goes away today changed forever. Let's pray.